It's our final day here on the Great Canadian Book Debate. We started with five great titles. Each one shifted our perspective in different ways. Three books have been eliminated to our left, but only one can win. I'm your host, Ali Hassan. This is Canada Reads. This is Canada Reads, Canada's annual title fight. A lot has happened this week. On day one, we said goodbye to Mexican Gothic by Silvia Moreno-Garcia. That novel was selected by Tasneem Gidi. Hello, Tasneem. Hi, how are you? Great, thank you. On day two, Greenwood by Michael Christie was eliminated, the novel that Keegan Connor Tracy was backing. Hi, Keegan. Hello. Yesterday, day three, we had a tense vote. We had a tie. <laughs> but in the end, we did say goodbye to the novel Hotline by Dimitri Nasrallah. It was championed by Gurdip Pander. How are you feeling today, Gurdip? I'm feeling great, Ali. Okay, let's take a let's take a moment, take your time, and uh, remind everyone why Canada should read Hotline. Thank you. I chose this book, Hotline, by Dimitri Nasrallah, as a medium to convey a larger message to my fellow Canadians. I know you may say you love all, but there is something deep inside which is not letting you love some of them. I want you to reflect on that and pinpoint that discomfort in your heart where it comes from, which stops you from embracing the people from diversity and other cultures. Most likely you need to take down all those pre-existing patterns, ideas and walls of discomfort. Then come outside, outside of those enclosures to breathe in an open, fresh air, then panoramic love will happen. The love of embracing humanity without judgments, fears, and that discomfort. We are all interconnected. We all belong to each other. Then we need to take care of every member of our universal family. We need to practice beyond borders inclusivity. So, Take step number one, read Hotline, and read many books similar to Hotlines, which are different. All right, thank, thank you, Gurdeep. Tasneem, Keegan, Gurdeep, you are all now free agents. As such, you hold the power to decide which book will be eliminated and which book will win. <clears throat> the people who have to capture their hearts and minds are the two remaining panelists, no pressure. Some pressure, a lot of pressure. Uh, Matea, you are championing one of the two books still in contention, the graphic memoir, Ducks, by Kate Beaton. Your book almost got eliminated, but you survived yesterday's tie. How are you feeling going into the, today's finals? I'm feeling very lucky to still be in the running, and I'm feeling, you know, kind of surprised, I guess. Like, I knew it was going to be an uphill battle to promote a graphic memoir, something that's very different in genre and form from the other books that were in this competition. So... I'm just excited to get to talk about it one last time. Michael, your book is the other one in contention, the other title. The novel Station Eleven by Emily St. John Mandel, it had some votes against it as well. How confident are you feeling today? Well, um, you know, I love this book, and uh, I've, I've loved speaking about literature with this panel. So I'm, I'm just really looking forward to a great conversation. All right. Thank you, Michael. It is the final day. Let's do this. We're going to start today with two debate rounds. Michael and Matea will each make their opening statements, and then we'll see what the panelists have to say. Matea, you're up first. You are championing Ducks by Kate Beaton. Here's the trailer. Meet Katie Beaton. She's 21 years old. She wants to be a cartoonist. She's fresh out of school and saddled with debt. Reluctant to leave behind her close-knit seaside community for life in the unforgiving oil sands, where bulldozers are the size of buildings. The attention and harassment are constant. It's hard and lonely work that can change people for the worse. And the destruction of the environment and the local communities is just the cost of doing business. To survive, she forms bonds, finds hope, camaraderie, and solidarity with a trusted few, just like ducks 
we migrate, seeking greener pastures, bluer skies, and the promise of a better life. Matea, you have 60 seconds. Why should ducks win Canada Reads? We are all implicated in the story that Ducks tells. Ducks is one woman's story, but it is the story more broadly of an industry that we all rely on in some way. Whether we are people living in Alberta who actually work in the sands, who go there to make a living and face just these like unlivable conditions, face addiction with absolutely no support, no mental health support, face workplace safety incidents, whether we're people that live in central Canada and like benefit, frankly, from the, the wealth that our country generates due to oil, we are all implicated by the ethical questions raised by this book. I think most specifically what this book does is it creates an empathy and a sense of understanding across people who come from different parts of the country. We've talked a lot, or I've talked a lot, about this story of the going down the road of leaving Cape Breton, Newfoundland, other places in the Atlantic provinces, and that sense of displacement. But I also think that this book articulates the perspective of Albertans who maybe feel as though the rest of the country is riding their coattails. I won't comment on how I feel about those opinions, but they are real and they're something we need to grapple with. Thank you, Matea. Okay, panelists, you heard what Matea has to say. What do you think? Michael, you go first. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm you know, really pleased that you talked about the, uh, the implications uh, of, of us as Canadians, uh, as, as people who, um, who profit you know, from, from the work that happens there. Uh, I, you know, when I, when I speak about the book, you know, there's, there's two ways to really angle it. It's like, it's a book, it's a, it's a work of literature. And, you know, we talk about the, its structure, its characters, but these are also real people. So I think the, the criticisms we have for, for the book, um, you know, are not necessarily indictments of, of a person or, or, or their choices. Uh, I think it's, I'm saddened by this book. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think the questions that it raises, um, that Kate herself, tried to answer, um, is that the migrant workers, we'll call them, you know, um, have choices about where to work and how to make their money. And, you know, in the opening chapter, she said, you know, there's lots of places to get work. I can stay here and try to find work, but the best and easiest way, I think that's a quote, is to go there to make money in these in the short time, and I think about the costs, mm -hmm. um, certainly for Indigenous people, mm -hmm. uh, certainly for the environment, and I think uh, that when those workers leave and they take that wealth, um, there's this void, and I'm saddened to think that that's that's the answer. Mm -hmm. It's been Canada's answer for a long mm -hmm. time about how we make choices that benefit us, expediency mm -hmm. over the lives of, of the people who live there. And, you know, I think about those, you know, the, the communities that are left that suffer through cancers mm -hmm. and devastation. And so this, this book is, is really sobering. How, how, do you, how do you respond to those criticisms? Mm -hmm. I think how I respond to that is, you know, I want to circle back to this being one person's story, right? Because you're right. This is one person's decision to make money in a way that was perhaps the most expedient, at least in terms of achieving that goal. I think that this book shines an important light on the reality of what that looks like for a lot of people who choose to go into an industry in order to make money quickly, right? Just that, you know, you can't necessarily anticipate the horrors that await you as an individual. And I think something I've been thinking about a lot this week is the way that, like, of course, settler colonialism has done the most damage to Indigenous communities, but it's also a system that is deeply unhealthy for the settlers that participate in it in a lot of ways. I think we see in this book the way that people become quite warped in some cases and really harmed by their participation in that system as workers. I think, of course, there are perspectives that are left out of this book. What I do think is interesting is that the afterword really engages with that void that you're talking about, right? So there's the main text of the book in which it's kind of taking us through what it was like for Kate to live that reality of working in the sands, right? It doesn't give us that sort of self-reflection that sometimes in graphic memoirs you'll see in like the, the gutters, right? The spaces around the panels. You'll sometimes see that commentary. It's left to the afterword where she acknowledges, you know what? Yeah. 
there are things I should have been thinking about maybe when I was younger that I just didn't really have the range to consider that now that she's in the position to write this book, she does have the range to consider. And I think that because that afterward has been appended, and I, you know, this isn't in the book, but I think about the way that she's articulated herself in interviews to talk about some of these things that you're mentioning of, you know, the indigenous communities in the area that are just being devastated by these cancers that no one seems to care to investigate. It's a thorny question, right? And I think the fact that this book is so sobering and, and leaves us with that discomfort is actually part of why it's so important for Canadians to engage with it. Can I respond to something? Michael, uh, you, you even asked uh, Matea for a response, <laughs> making my host job redundant there. So you can, of course you can respond, yeah. You know, to, to analyze the character mm -hmm. in the book, you know, Katie, the character, leaves, um, you know, the same crew after, you know, really horrifying mm -hmm. sexual harassment and assault. And she goes to Victoria mm -hmm. as, a, as a break. Mm -hmm. You know, if we were just analyzing this as a character, it's like, why? Why, knowing what she knew, mm -hmm. did she go back, mm -hmm. you know, to, to make more money, mm -hmm. you know? Like, what's the, what's the rationale? Like, if we're just looking at it as like, how, how do we build sympathy? Mm -hmm. You know, how does the author try to build sympathy for a choice that, that Katie's making with now, you know, certain knowledge. Mm -hmm. I guess the way I think about it, because you're, you're referring in this case specifically to her own experience and how horrifying it was. I think there are many situations in lots of industries, not just, you know, working in resource extraction, but I think even of people who deal with like in offices, sexual harassment and get continued to work in that environment people feel like their choices are limited in ways that perhaps we as external observers might recognize that they are not. You know, maybe she could have stayed in Victoria working these two jobs just endlessly forever and stared down that void of student debt for many more years. I've known that feeling. That's certainly how I felt leaving college with like $60,000 of debt. I was very lucky in a way that the vast majority of people are not to be able to eliminate that really quickly. I think I want to be careful to not judge too much the choices of an actual person as opposed to a character, right? I think maybe I had that inherent sympathy of I can understand why you might feel like you need to put yourself in a really terrible situation in order to eliminate that debt. I was working like 60 hour weeks after graduating school because I just wanted to get rid of it as quickly as possible. I'm very, I feel very lucky that I never was forced into a choice like this, but I, I guess I have that implicit understanding of why you might feel like that was the only path you could take. Oh, that sorry. is it for this oh, round. Uh, it's more of an observer listener round for our free panelists. We have a lot of debate to get to, a lot of opportunity to uh, to weigh in. Michael, you're championing Station Eleven by Emily St. John Mandel. Let's check out that trailer. Toronto, a production of King Lear. On stage, the star has a heart attack. A paramedic tries to save his life. An eight-year-old actress sees it all unfold. Meanwhile, the Georgia flu spreads around the world. A pandemic, and with it panic, chaos, and death. 20 years later, the little girl, Kirsten, is fully grown. She's in a troupe of actors and musicians who travel across the Great Lakes. She doesn't remember much from before, but she remembers Arthur, King Lear that night. She still has the comic books he gave her. They hold the key to remember what was lost and to find our way forward. Michael, you have 60 seconds. Why should Station Eleven win Canada Reads? Station Eleven is a great novel. You know, from its opening moment set against uh, you know, our civilization's collapse to the terrors of the chaos that follows. The author propels us into the lives of five unforgettable characters and the choices they make to survive. The ambitions of Station Eleven celebrate all that readers love in a novel. Gorgeous prose, you know, rich in nuance, mystery, suspense, and stunning, fully realized portraits of its characters. Their journeys intertwine and overlap across the span of the book, leading us to a climax of aching beauty and surprise. And as we, as we Canadians, seek to find our own footing after the devastations of COVID, 
This book charts a path for us, one filled with tenderness and grace. Thank you, Michael. Okay, panelists, you just heard Michael. Um, the question is the same. Why do you think... What do you think about Michael's argument for why Station 11 should win? We'll model this round the same way we did on the last one. Matea, what do you think about what Michael just said? So, I agree with a lot of your characterization of the book. I loved reading it. I thought it was a fantastically written novel. I think there are a lot of novels that are fantastically written that I've really enjoyed that I would not go so far as to say as I think all of Canada should read them. And I think particularly where I struggle with this book is that it is the earliest to publish of all of the novels in this competition. It's one that I think a lot of Canada kind of already has read. And the sort of lessons and takeaways from it, like I felt as though I didn't learn much from it that I hadn't learned from living through the pandemic, if that makes sense. So I, I suppose what I'm wondering is, you know, you mentioned this idea of like, this gives us lessons for after COVID. Like, I kind of feel as though you either learned lessons from COVID living through it or you didn't, right? There are the people who really wanted to go just back to normal and pretend like the whole thing never happened. And then there are people who learned the sort of takeaways that you get from the book. So I guess my question is like, why do you think now is the moment for this book to win on the show? And I guess I'm also doing Ali's job. <laughs> no, uh -huh. right? Uh, please. Um, it's a wonderful question. I think Keegan raised it as well is that, you know, this was a, a, a pandemic, a global pandemic, and with the, you know, dissolution, disruption that we faced, we barely survived it. Like, can we imagine something as devastating as this? Um, I think it's really useful uh, still, you know, at this moment, as we look, you know, across the table, at ourselves, at our own communities, for what we were able to do as a result of, of COVID, you know? How do you answer, though, to people who have, like, uh, um, pandemic fatigue? Why are they going to want to enter into this book? Um, well, just to continue with my answer, um, I think it's essential, actually, that the ideas of community that, that are championed in the book uh, w weren't fully realized in COVID. Mm -hmm. We were isolated, we rejected, we pushed people away. Um, we were utterly fearful. And I think what the book strives to do in every instance is to say, you know, despite our differences, despite the different places we come from, we are a community. Like the Museum of Civilization was a perfect place. You know, you know, flights from Singapore, flights from Hong Kong. And in those moments, there were models, models for how we treat each other. You know, how do we how do we behave when everything else is faltering, falling apart around us? And I think people behave with grace. Like, you know, there's, there's so many examples in our world that, that in response to COVID, you know, in response to masking and that kind of, of controversy, that we actually were driven apart. And I think this is an antidote to that. I, I think this is not a book that drills down into those differences, but suggests actually a way to bridge them. What are your thoughts on that, Matthew? I think, I mean, we see some suggestions of that. I think one thing that, again, thinking about this book in conversation with some of the other books that have been in this competition that I struggle with a little bit more upon rereading and reanalyzing is, I don't know that we get enough analysis. We have this beautiful story of community building. There are also some real stories of things going terribly wrong in this book, right? There is, you know, n there's this sort of expression of like just how chaotic everything is, of these like lines of cars leaving cities, of the total lack of coordination. We kind of hear about it, we don't hear much about the why. And I think that that's the thing that's really interesting to me about what we lived through in the pandemic. You're talking about how people responded to it through this sense of isolation and aggression and resistance in some cases. This book doesn't quite get into why that happens. And then later on during kind of the post pandemic, the 20 years on, we have this element of fundamentalism that comes out of it with the prophet. And I think that we're left to fill in the blanks quite a lot in this book of how he came to be that way. We're sort of connecting the dots of like, okay, well, this is a kid who was raised by kind of a hippy dippy mom who believes that everything happens for a reason. And then this cataclysmic event occurs, dot, dot, dot. Mm -hmm. Now he's a religious fanatic. 
I think I can imagine a, a little bit how that might happen, but I would have been really interested to know more, you know, if we're gonna draw this comparison of this book providing us like a way forward out of our current situation, I wish there'd maybe been more about like, okay, but how do we avoid these pitfalls that we're so clearly walking into? Because even the aspect of religious fundamentalism, like we're seeing that in the United States, certainly right now, we're seeing it as well, you know, it doesn't just cross the border up here, like it goes both ways. We're seeing it here too. Let me I give the final sorry, word to you, Michael, oh. on this, uh, <laughs> okay. just before we wrap. Right. You know, I think um, if, we look at the, if, we, if we look at this book through its characters and we look at someone like Tyler, who is the prophet, and we look at someone who's, cur you know, Kirsten, like, again, they're models for how we, how we can change. Tyler and, and that world of fanaticism is about control, it's about destruction. And Kirsten, on the other hand, um, carries the past with her, but she's whole. She chooses to create. So we're really looking at two versions of life, creation, destruction. And that's, I think, um, where the novel really succeeds. That is it for this round. Shout out to our panelists who have been our, our, our free agents silent. here. We have, <laughs> we have to hear listening, rocking <laughs> back and forth. <laughs> your time is coming. I promise you, your time is coming. A little podcast. I'm here for it. <laughs> the final day of Canada Reads is intense. It's going to get more intense. The debate isn't close to over yet. Well, let's take a breather before we get back at it. Matea and Michael, pay attention to this. Hi, Michael. It's Carly Jaguzic here. I'm so excited about your journey on this show, and I know you can take it all the way to the end. It's so cool that a little class discussion led to this opportunity, and I really can't think of anyone better for it. You constantly inspire me and all of your students with all you do, and I know we're all so proud of you. You can do this. Hi, Matea. It's Avneet, your friend. Oh I just God. wanted to use this very public forum to reiterate how much I love and appreciate your friendship. I'm personally very glad that you now get to experience the joy that is sitting in a circle and talking about books, which in my opinion is one of the great joys of life. So once again, I love you and best of luck. Hey dad, it's Micah. Hi dad, it's Lilia. I'm super proud of you and I'm so excited to hear you on this show and I wish you the best of luck. I think you're gonna do great. I'm sending you lots of love and good luck for Canada Reads. I know you'll be amazing. Hey Michael, it's Nancy. I'm so excited for you. <laughs> I'm so impressed that you managed to read all the books with plenty of time to spare and you didn't <laughs> save it for this past weekend. I am delighted for you to share with all of Canada your professorial voice because it's so hot. And I think you're gonna kill this. <laughs> Hello, Matea, this is your father, your old dad. And I just want Not to say how voice. proud we are that you're representing ducks accent. by Kate Beaton. Um, now in, in the regular accent, Matea, uh, so excited. I know how uh, early your love of reading started and uh, this is a culmination and I know you're gonna have fun. So best of luck and I'll be tuning in. Hello, Matea. This is Mom, sending you lots of luck and oodles of best wishes. As your mom, I am your original debate sparring partner, so I know full well how capable you are. You learn from the best. Revert to your high school and university debate intensity, and all will go well. Love you, my porcelain gorilla. <laughs> That was Carly Jagusik, one of the students who first recommended Station Eleven to Michael. You also heard Matea's friend, Avneet Sharma, Michael's wife, Nancy, and his kids, Lilia and Micah, and Matea's parents, Phil and Patty, with some words of encouragement for our two remaining contenders. Interesting there, your, your wife, Michael, exposed you as a, a massive procrastinator. Um, <laughs> also called you hot, right? That uh, people would love their partner to call them hot publicly. <laughs> and uh, Matea, your parents, uh, your dad going deep into his Atlantic Canadian uh, identity. Like, where did that come <laughs> from? <laughs> and mom, of course, uh, giving you some uh, props, but also giving a shout out to herself, mm -hmm. uh, which is interesting. We may have to take Patty Roach's name down for a future Canada Patty Reads panel. We've got to respect the maiden McKinnon, name. McKinnon, McKinnon, mm -hmm. we'll, uh, we'll, we'll take note. Yeah. I'm Ali Hassan. This is Canada Reads on CBC and Sirius XM. Let's get back to the debate. We have two books still standing, Ducks by Kate Beaton and Station Eleven by Emily St. John Mandel. 
I want to compare the two books on the table directly. So, Matea, what does Ducks have that Station Eleven doesn't? I think that there is a uniqueness to what Ducks does that I didn't quite feel Station Eleven also did. The way I would describe it is Ducks moved me in a way that I think no other book has. Station Eleven, the lessons that we take from it, the characterization and the allegory, Michael, that you were getting into of these representations of almost archetypes of how we can choose to deal with a difficult situation, I think there are many books that if we dive down into them, they do that well. But Ducks is, to, to date anyway, the only novel or book or, or just kind of literary work that gets into this very particular experience of working in the oil sands and the even more niche experience that Kate had specifically as somebody who was a minority in that community as one of the few women working there. I think that the the specificity that we get and just like the the fact that it's a graphic novel as well and so many people kind of write that off entirely as a genre, um, that to me is what this book does and, and we'll get into in the discussion like just all of the things that I think it's able to do as a result of those differences. Michael, I'm gonna let you chew on that for a moment. Tasneem, let's bring you in. <laughs> yeah, you know, one thing that you discussed earlier about with The Prophet, I completely agree, and I was struggling to say that on day one, was one thing that I will really give to Ducks is Kay could have easily written off every single man in, Cape, in Alberta as an evil person. And I don't think I would be as gracious enough to try to understand the why behind it. And I was so shocked that she did it because if it was me, I would have just painted everybody as evil and call it a day. But the fact that she took the time to understand like, oh, maybe they're away from home. Maybe they're, you know, with addiction, with abuse and everything. So I really love that part. And with Station Eleven, I think you're right. You know, the strength of that novel is the craft and the fact that it was trying to also be a character analysis novel, but with some of the characters because of the pacing and how it was like alternating in POVs, we didn't really get to see that with the prophet in terms, as in relation to the other characters. So for the prophet, for me, he seemed evil for evil's sake. So when he was removed, I didn't really feel impacted as I wanted to, compared, comparing the two. But I think when it comes to the craft, like it's so strong and I loved it so much. Gurdeep, let me bring you in here. What does Ducks do that Station Eleven doesn't? Uh, I think it's a beautiful, touching memoir. Uh, it's a personal lived experience. Uh, that is uh, uh, absolutely what happened in someone's life. Like, uh, there's no fiction. And the learning comes through it because uh, we all have personal experiences and when we share them, and it brings many, many educational lessons to us, how we can grow as a society, how we can work to remove that uh, misogyny, those barriers, uh, biases and other things, how we can grow as a country. Uh, to grow as a country, we need to first learn. Um, this book has those learning lessons. And then uh, we meet, need to make right choices so that everybody is, uh, is uh, feeling welcomed, included, respected, most importantly. Um, so, so that's the great uh, thing about ducks, I can say. Keegan? Uh, well, to some degree, it's like comparing apples and oranges. You know, this is a novel, this is a memoir, they're very different structurally, there's all of those different things. I, I think uh, perhaps it will boil down to how they make you feel, uh, what they shine a light on. Uh, certainly, Station Eleven, for me, shines a light on the sort of ludicrous nature of, of fame and this sort of avaricious consumption that we have in our culture and how nullified it would be by what happens in that book and how vulnerable we are to like all the things we think are important how they would just be gone in a moment and I think you know it really leaves you with that question uh, but ducks I think uh, f for me in particular even though I know Kate didn't want it to be a big part of what we took out of this but to bring to light the sexual violence that so many women experience and to, to really like bald face put that in front of people and make them deal with that even though it wasn't the central theme uh, I think that is a message that people need to see. Um, and I, I mean, I think those are, they, they both really are, so. Let me give yeah. the final word to you. Oh, well, I was gonna say, I would, I would actually kind of push back against the idea of like, it's not a main theme. It's certainly not the main theme. I don't think there is just one main theme to this book, or if you can kind of chalk it up to that, it's really just about like, what happens when people are put in these isolated environments and are confronted every day with like these very difficult ethical realities. But yeah, I think that the portrayal of sexual violence in Ducks 
it's one of those things where it's it's extremely emotionally impactful without being like viscerally triggering in a way that a more graphic like you know demonstrative depiction of it might be yep. and I think that that was such a powerful thing that she included in this book um yeah I, okay. I guess we'll end it there <laughs> yes all right that is it for this round let's turn our focus to station 11. Michael what does station 11 have that ducks does not you know one of the things that I, I love about station 11 um is the voicing that um Emily St. John Mandel is able to create uh Voicing, of course, means that, you know, when a character speaks, like, it's born of that character. Like, it can't be traded. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I've been in an industry where um, dialogue is, is crucial to, you know, central to the work. And station level, the voicing um, of all its characters is really profoundly good. Uh, yesterday, you talked about the amalgam of men you know, in, in, in Ducks. Um, do you feel, and, and much of it is written from memory, you know, 15 years after the fact. Um, do you feel that uh, uh, Kate um, loses opportunity because those, those men are amalgams and that, that she's unable to, as an author, create voicing that's really particular? So... I would say, I wouldn't say unable so much as the form of the memoir prioritizes the author's own voice and own kind of perception of things over giving voice to those other characters. So I think that the other people in, the, in this book are given voice. You know, we have dialogue from plenty of other people who are not Kate. And a lot of it is quite specific and particular to them. You know, I think about Ambrose that I mentioned, I believe, on day two, really articulating that feeling of displacement of like, I'm still a fisherman, I'm just here now. Uh, I think about there's a character, Ryan, who's Kate's supervisor for a period of time, who you see him spinning out after a difficult divorce, feeling that sense of isolation, lapsing into addiction, and then suddenly disappearing. So she doesn't perhaps give as much, like, you know, interiority to those characters as perhaps an author like Emily St. John Mandel does because she's writing from these different points of view. I think they're just very different kinds of books, right? So it's true that your book perhaps has that in a way that Ducks doesn't. I don't think that that's a shortcoming of Ducks, though. I think it's more a function of the different forms that these books take. Keegan, what are your thoughts on this? I know that your voting was uh, not in favor of Station Eleven uh, twice, but I wanted to put this question to you. What does Station Eleven do that Ducks doesn't? Um, <clears throat> I think it just tells a more layered tale than ducks uh, necessarily again like i'm saying it's apples and oranges to some degree uh they're very different st um, structurally they're I, I just think in terms of like a story that you can get swept up in and lost in certainly it has that in a way that ducks does not ducks just takes you into a different place uh, it, it, they have entirely different vibes, I would say, for lack of a better word in that respect. What they leave you with, how, they, how you feel in your gut about them, in some ways is the same, actually. There's a certain, like, blah, that you feel throughout both of them because of the subject matter. Um, uh, but I guess, overall, I, I think Station Eleven, just because it's a novel, it was easier to get, you know, sort of lost in the tale. Disney? Yeah, I do agree with what you had to say about that, especially with Ducks. I know you were saying yesterday that with graphic novels, um, that you have to read them a couple mm -hmm. of times, but like Ducks is a pretty big book, you it know, is. like she's chunky. And um, I think one of my main issues with it, and I know that you said that you read it like under four hours. For me, it did take me a long time because for the first, I want to say 60% of the novel, you know, Kate's really immersing you into the experience of actually living and working mm -hmm. in, in the day to day of in the oil sands. And a lot of it is repetitive. And again, like what everyone was saying, it's because you want to understand how it's like, being emotionally exhausted in an emotionally exhausting place. But then you have to also think about the reader experience in that as well. Mm -hmm. And rereading that over and over again to try to understand the bigger message, for me, it was very hard to. But that, again, I think that's just also the structure of the book. And I don't know if that's a you know, critique on graphic memoirs as a whole or just ducks. But for me, I, yeah, I think for that reason I did with Station 11 is easier for, to the immersive experience. Mm -hmm. Kudeep, I'll put the question to you as well. Um, I saw this novel um, in terms of uh, different voices and their representation as well. Uh, there are four characters in this book and uh, they have very important voices in uh, like from the beginning until the end of the book. Uh, they are Miranda, Jeevan, Saeed and Frank. So all these four characters, they come from different uh, 
uh, backgrounds, different cultures, uh, different parts of the world. Uh, and uh, they have been important seeing in different events. So I, from those voices, I felt that uh, um, Emily St. John Monday, she did a very good balancing act where she combined uh, all different characters, uh, where she thought that, oh, uh, let's make it uh, like, uh, like, like a novel where everybody matters, like inclusivity. Um, and uh, when I see ducks, yes, uh, amazing, touching uh, memoir, uh, I kind of felt that uh, that little bit piece where there are so many people working in oil sands. I know from my own experiences, there are a number of people who come from uh, different backgrounds. Uh, um, they are people of color, they are people from black and indigenous communities. Uh, uh, their names could be mentioned a little bit more. Uh, so that's the little comparison, but both books are great in well, many ways. This, we wanted to focus on Station Eleven in this round, so let me give the final word to you, Michael, with the half a minute that we have left. You know, you know if we look at these works, and I'm, I'm so glad people are really recognizing that they're really so very different. Um, Station Eleven um, reinvents the genre. It reimagines um, dystopia. Uh, because when you look at a lot of these books, like if you think about The Road, you know, The Stand, uh, you know, classics, uh, Parable of the Sower, in many ways, these books are horror novels, you know, that they immerse you in the terror of that moment. And what I admire so much about Emily St. John Mandel is that she actually is not interested in bringing us there, but she's bringing us to the other side. She gives us 20 years beyond as, as an example. That is it for this round. Okay, as we head into the final votes, I want to pose this question to everybody at the Canada Reads table. Which of the two books taught you the most about the messiness of being human? Tasneem, I'll start with you. I want to say Station Eleven. And as I was rereading it last night, I don't know if it's really like a criticism of the genre or also of the book, or even if it's like a compliment, but she wrote this before COVID happened. So reading this during COVID was a very unique experience because in Emily's world, um, after the endemic, you know, social structures and everything, they were kind of gone. And it was so interesting to see how, you know, after a flu, they just came together. And it was just all about human experience, and like, just like grappling about the humanity of it all. But in COVID, it was a complete opposite, you know? It actually revealed that social structures and social inequities were exacerbated. And I'm coming at this from a healthcare perspective. COVID, yes, it did impact all of us, but it didn't impact us all proportionately. Um, so I thought that was a really interesting comparison. I'm like, well, what? Imagine if COVID, like, that happened, and what could have happened if everything was gone? So, I don't know. I don't know if it's, like, a criticism or, like, a compliment, but it did help me change how I view humans, I guess. Keegan, mm -hmm. your thoughts on this? Which book taught you the most about the messiness of human beings? Oh, my goodness. Um, I mean, I think they both, in equal measure, have some uh, success in that. Certainly, uh, we see a very ugly side of what it's like to work in isolated places and what it can do to be... How, how some of those men were like, they're not the same there as they are at home, which I think can be a, ducks, an excuse yeah. for bad behavior, but also, like, helps us comprehend there's a truth behind that, that people can become different. Uh, it, it makes you think about that. Um, something... I don't know if this really answers that question, but it popped up as this was going on, and I had wondered if before. One thing it never talks about, and I, I found it interesting that it was never something that peaked out for you, or maybe it did. Uh, I wondered, like, how did the indigenous communities do in this? In They're this, never, in this book. 11, yeah. yeah, because especially the isolated ones, like, were they just like, we're good, <laughs> you know? We didn't need you all anyhow. <laughs> um, I, I just thought it was interesting that it was never dealt with, and it was something that had popped up, and it came back in this moment. Uh, yeah, that's, it's, it's not a, a focus of, of the book. I, I will say that isolation probably um, protected communities. Mm -hmm. And it reminds me that in that moment, you know, the age-old questions of what do we do with outsiders? How do we treat them? Um, obviously, you know, the, the late, great Jeff Barnaby um, spoke to this really powerfully in Blood Quantum, you know, where he imagined walls going up around these communities to protect them. Because just as the Europeans brought disease that decimated our communities, you know, 
so too the Georgia flu is coming upon us again. And I imagine those same kinds of questions um, were asked across Turtle Island. Pradeep, which of these two books taught you the most about being, about the messiness of being human? <laughs> In terms of showing human messiness, uh, both books, I, I feel that they are digging deeper and deeper. Um, it's a, but I really liked uh, um, that uh, after 20 years, um, like humanity was going on. People killing each other, people uh, not trusting each other, uh, people uh, are just are enemies of other people. Suddenly, we are so kind to each other, we are taken care of, and suddenly we are fearing from each other. And, and oh my God, what happens at, at the airport uh, when uh, they had to even uh, create a security at the airport. So, and, and there are not so many people. 99% uh, world population is gone. And there are just a few people and people are not trusting each other. Uh, that, that, is the, uh, that is revealing the human messiness part. Okay, Matea? Yeah. I think both of these books really reveal the messiness of being human. And I want to focus the lens on ducks, not just because it's my own book that I am charged with defending, but because I think a lot of the comments that we've heard from the other panelists so far have focused really on Station Eleven. I think what ducks does is it shows the messiness of a situation that is real and ongoing. Station Eleven, it has relation to things that we've all lived through, absolutely. But the situations described in ducks the ethical quandaries, these are real things that people are living through literally as we are sitting around this table and talking. And I think that, you know, as much as it shows kind of the, the horrors of even if you're somebody who's relatively more privileged, who's able to extract wealth from, you know, the oil sands, how it can still be extremely, like, degrading and to who you are as a person and to your humanity to work in that environment, I think that that shows mess. But we also do see some of that, you know, more hopeful side with the solidarity that we see between people who move out to the oil sands from the Maritimes. The fact that when Katie arrives there, she has people who take her in for Thanksgiving and want to show her the way, that there's always people who, despite the horrors that she faces, are looking out for her, whether that's some of her older male colleagues, whether that's her sister and her friend that come out there with her. I think that that shows, you know, also this side that we see in Station Eleven, like, Ducks has that, too, of showing how we can really be there for one another, even in these, like, very difficult and inhumane situations. Michael, let me shift this question a little bit, because you brought up this idea of being an outsider. Which book does the best job of making you feel what it's like to be an outsider? You know... Uh, I think, I think obviously both novels have um, angles uh, to approach that question. Uh, I think what Ducks misses, um, you know, by being a memoir, is that it focuses on a singular point of view, you know, that the people around her are blended, you know, amalgamated, um, towards a thesis, a thesis of disorientation. Um, but by isolating that community, you know, these, these uh, economic migrants that come to this community, it, you know, opens up that world. But again, it leaves the world around it completely ignored and outside of that discussion. Mm -hmm. You know, so I, I feel that that's quite sad. It's, it's, it's a quite a Canadian thing um, uh, to make decisions that benefit yourself and say, if I had to weigh my decisions, how um, do, does my priorities matter more than the community that is left to clean up the mess? Mm -hmm. Your thoughts on that, Michael? I think the fact that you mentioned the specific words left to clean up the mess is really interesting because that is actually verbatim something that is said actually by one of the characters that's on the other side of things than what you're describing in the novel. There's a piece, or I say novel, in the memoir, there's a piece where there is a protest that's done at the uh, site that Kate's working at by Greenpeace activists uh, that causes massive damage and requires a lot of cleanup. And one of the workers in the oil sands expresses this frustration of like, who do you think has to clean this up? Who's being harmed here? I agree that people perhaps are prioritizing their own individual well-being over the, the idea of the well-being of the broader community. But I think that if we go into the minds of those people, what they're thinking is, 
I need to put food on the table for my family. Who's going to help me do that if I don't go and work in this job? Who's there for them? I think this is why like, you see a lot of these oil sands workers really resistant to the idea of just transition, even though it's what we need to do to move away from this extractive like, mode of production, because they don't trust that anyone's gonna be there for them in those instances. I feel as though in order to understand the broader context and the world around, because I agree that's not what this book is about, I think we have to actually go in and understand that very siloed experience in order to get to that broader understanding. But so. those choices are made in, in the assumption that there's no other work, and yet there is. That is it for this round. All right, Matea, Michael, you're almost done. Here is some motivation to help you cross that finish line. Michael, hi, it's Emily St. John Mandel. I just want to thank you. It's amazing that we're down to the last two books. I can't tell you how much I appreciate the time and the passion and the thoughtfulness that you've brought to this, to Station Eleven. It means a lot to me. Thank you so much. And I'm so excited that we've made it this far. Hello, Matea. I, well, I got my voice back. <laughs> <laughs> well, congrats on making it this far. You know, it, it's very humbling to be represented by somebody who you know would trounce you in a debate yourself. Mm -hmm. So really, it, it's been my pleasure to ride your coattails thus far. If somebody is new to comics because of Canada Reads, I'm very glad to have been a part of that. Good luck. We'll talk to you later. These were the voices of Emily St. John Mandel, the author of the novel Station Eleven, and Kate Beaton, the author of the graphic memoir Ducks, showing some love and appreciation to Matea and Michael. I'm Ali Hassan. This is Canada Reads on CBC and Sirius XM. Matea and Michael, it's almost time to vote. You have one last chance to persuade the three free agents at the table that your book, the one you are championing, should be the champion Canada Reads. I'm going to give you each a minute. Matea, this is your final opportunity to make a case for ducks. 60 seconds are on the clock. All right, first things first, our theme. I know people have mixed feelings about lying on theme. Mm -hmm. Ducks is a graphic memoir that is the first graphic novel that many people, I think, in Canada are picking up as a direct result of that competition. And I'm reminded of the Bong Joon-ho quote when he won the Oscar for Best Picture for Parasite, where he said, if you can get over the barrier of the one-inch barrier of subtitles to watch foreign films, an entire world of other stories opens up to you. I think a lot of people, and this is something we've addressed in this competition, feel that there's a barrier to engaging with graphic novels that has perhaps been removed by its inclusion, and I think that that is a perspective shift. I want to address each person very quickly. Tasneem, you spoke about genre and how we need to expand the bounds of what we read so eloquently. I think this book does that. Keegan, you spoke about how your perspective on graphic memoir shifted as a result of reading this book and seeing the power of what it can do. Gurdip, you spoke so powerfully about the idea of isolation and feeling like an outsider and just the idea of displacement from home and hotline. I think that this book has that. Michael, I think the ethical questions you raise are exactly why this book is so important, but I know you won't vote for me anyway. <laughs> Thank you, Matea. Nice of you to include Michael in that anyway, I guess. Michael, uh, one last chance to uh, champion Station Eleven. 60 seconds are on the clock. We've spoken all week about shifting perspectives. And I think we can construe that to mean that we learn something new. Um, but I think it can also mean to be reminded of something we've forgotten. One of the gifts of Station Eleven is that it asks you to hold on to what is beautiful in your life and cherish it. There was snow falling onto the stage when Arthur Leander died. That image is echoed inside the paperweight that was given to Kirsten that night as a gift, and that she carried it with her through the horrors that followed. It had no function as a survival tool. It was just dead weight, but she refused to let it go. There are scores of moments like that in this book. So I hope when you leave here, you are reminded to see beauty or create and carry it with you. Thank you, Michael. And that is it for this year's debate. It all comes down to this. Panelists, it's time to cast your final vote. Your ballots are in front of you, and just like the last three days, you are voting to eliminate a title. The last book standing will win Canada Reads.
Once you have voted, Bridget from the Canada Reads team will collect your ballots. She will go around the circle. Please hand her your ballot and you are ready. There is a variety of speed with which these votes are uh, being made. Different people, Matea and, Mate and Michael, quite, quick, really quite quickly. It. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah, today, uh, it was hard to decide. Well, I will tell you, I'm going to remind our listeners and our viewers about um, how this week went. Tasneem, we could describe you as a, an unpredictable voter. Greenwood on day one, Ducks on day two, Hotline on day three. Keegan, you voted against Mexican Gothic and then Station Eleven on both day two and day three, and then eventually the tiebreaker came to you and it was Hotline that was decided on. Gradeep, you have voted against Mexican Gothic, Greenwood, and Ducks. Yesterday on the third day, you voted against Ducks. Matea, you have voted against Mexican Gothic, Greenwood, and Hotline. Michael, Mexican Gothic on day one, on day two, Greenwood, and on and day three, Ducks. That is the, uh, the sort of the lay of the land here for this week. And I think both Matea and Michael did a pretty formidable job uh, bringing out everything. Nothing, I don't, I don't feel like anything has been left on the table today. I think you brought out every argument you could to defend your book and, uh, and do your best to, to um, you know, challenge whatever perceptions our free agents have. I have the ballots. All right, Matea Roach, we get a good sense of what this would be, but we, uh, we ask. In any case, how did you vote? Um, as required by the rules of the competition, yes. but also because I genuinely feel this way, I voted to eliminate Station 11. Okay, one vote against Station 11. Michael Gray Eyes, same question to you. I voted against ducks today. Shocked <laughs> <gasps> and <Ridiculous>. horrified. <laughs> <laughs> Couldn't have seen it, guys. Station 11 and ducks both have one vote against them. Keegan Connor Tracy, how did you vote? I, I voted according to the mandate I was given, and I voted against Station 11. Okay, we have two votes against. Station 11. Gradeep Pandeir, how did you vote? It was hard to decide both books I love, but I voted for Ducks. Okay. We have two votes against Ducks and two votes against Station 11. Tasneem Gidi, which book did you vote to eliminate from Canada Reads? I voted for Station 11. Okay. And with that, Station 11 has been eliminated. And Ducks is the winner of Canada Reads 2023. Congratulations to you, Matea. That is wonderful news, I'm sure. How are you feeling? I'm really, I'm really overwhelmed. Um, <laughs> it was so nice to hear the voices of my parents um, because I think why this book touched me so deeply is it really reminded me of, of my roots and my family history. Um, and. My goal in doing this was to do right by Kate, to do right by her words and her experiences, and by extension... We, we uh, actually yeah. have a call with Kate Beaton. <laughs> Kate is standing by. Hello, Kate. We Hello. did? Hi. Uh, <laughs> oh. Hi. How are you guys? We're um, good. I guess you got the news. I did. I'm sorry. I think my dad is calling me right now. Oh, um, you take that I, call, Kate. We are going to. Uh, no, no, we're no. going to talk to you very soon. No. We are wrapping oh, up. We are. Yes, we're going to talk to you very soon. Uh, Canada Reads 23 is complete, and uh, Kate uh, Kate Beaton's memoir, uh, championed by Matea Roach, is the winner. You were incredible champions all week long. Thank you for your great discussions. I'm Ali Hassan. Until next time, read on, Canada. The radio doesn't get to hear that, I guess. That's uh, <laughs> another Canada Reads in the books. Uh, we are going to talk about what happened today. Um, I, obviously, I want to continue this discussion. Kate, you came in with a, a few seconds left uh, on radio, but yeah. let's, uh, we have some time to, to, to discuss this win and, and what it means to both you and Matea. Thank you. Sorry about the phone call there. Um, <laughs> Uh, th thank you so much to, to everyone, to Matea, this, this really belongs to you, I feel. And, uh, and it's such an honor to be in the company of, of these four brilliant books and their champions. I'm, I'm truly honored. Um, and, and I really want to thank you for, uh, for bringing up 
these things earlier uh, with Matea and Michael, because I, I can't come up here and not talk about this, that um, the issues of my book that take place in 2008, they're, they're happening right now. And, and, you know, if you want to change perspective, hopefully action follows suit. Um, because right now, the community of Fort Chippewyan, which is uh, near the oil sands, is dealing with the news that, that over 5 million liters of toxic waste has been spilled upstream from them. And they haven't been notified. Uh, it happened, you know, nine months ago or so, and they weren't notified until recently. And see, it was so easy for companies and government to take responsibility for the ducks that died in my book. And that for the longest time, it seemed like that was what everybody knew about. My time there became very emblematic of my time there um, because the ducks were, were so well known. Um, but it's, it's much harder. The human toll of oil and mining is much different. It is ongoing and indigenous communities, they suffer the worst of it. Um, so what good is a change perspective unless, you know, uh, if, if people are going to suffer as they always have under corporate and government power? Uh, the rare cancers that Selena Hart talks about in 2008 in my book have never been properly addressed or acknowledged. And, um, and I'm speaking in solidarity here. This is a very Canadian story, the story about extraction. Everyone in Cape Breton remembers what happened at the Sydney tar ponds when people were getting sick and nobody acknowledged why. Um, so uh, so I, I hope that, that reading my book, even though it is a time capsule of a, of a time when I was a very young person working in an industry that I didn't know very much about, gives you perspective on what it's like to actually be in there and realize that these things are, are ongoing issues and they often happen away from things. You know, if there was a, if there was a, a five million liter toxic waste leak into the Toronto water system, we would have a much different reaction than, than a, a sort of continued indifference, which is what we see when things happen in, on Indigenous lands surrounding extractive areas. Absolutely. Thank um, you very much, but, Kate. But th thank you for letting me talk about that. No, I not that. at all. I, it, it pains me to work to a, a hard clock, obviously, and, and you're yeah. complimenting what Matea has said uh, all week about this book. And I did yeah. want to give uh, Michael a moment to talk about Station Eleven. We have... Uh, two minutes left, and I thought it'd be nice to spend at least a minute uh, oh. of that uh, talking about the book that you defended so passionately. Thank you, thank you. Well, obviously, I loved Station Eleven, and I was so delighted, actually, that I had the opportunity, you know, to continue to speak about it, you know, in a really fulsome way. Um, I, I think, you know, one of the things I'm, I'm left with is that, uh, you know, it's created... Uh, uh, you know, the wonderful relationships I've never had. You know, I never thought in my life I'd, you know, speak to Emily St. John Mandel. Mm -hmm. And, you know, she's tweeting about it now and saying, thank you so much for what you're saying. Uh, but I'm just delighted that I could share my perspective um, uh, about the intricacies of the novel. Like, it's, it's, it's a book that you can return to and continue to mine. And I think that's what is truly beautiful about the novel form is um, that it rewards, you know, the more you dig. Uh, on that note of reward, I think it's valuable at this moment to, to, to talk about the reward of Canada Reads, uh, not just for readers and for yourselves as you sit at this table, but for the, uh, the writers and illustrators, you know, also. I mean, all the books have become bestsellers, so uh, I remind you that you're part of something very, very special in Canada and part of a very special discussion. But that is, uh, that is it for today. And that is it for Canada Reads 2023. Thank you so much, everyone, for joining us this week. You can catch up on Canada Reads 2023 at cbcbooks.ca. You can follow us on social media at CBC Books on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram. And a final thanks to this year's panel who, uh, who worked tire tirelessly and passionately all week. Matea Roach, Gurdip Pandeir, Keegan Connor Tracy, Tasneem Gili, and Michael Greyeyes. I'm Ali Hassan. This is Canada Reads. Until next time, read on, Canada.